looks like we're live. I see people starting to join. All right. How's everybody doing? Write a comment, comment below. <laughs> it's <laughs> people getting recognized already. Look at y'all. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us, Mirla. We're going to be discussing DACA. We're going to wait a couple more minutes um, for people to join us. Right. Make sure you send the link to your, your friends, your tias, your deals, your family. <laughs> Be like, watch this. <laughs> we'll be discussing DACA, the future of DACA, where it might be headed, where it came from. We're gonna wait just a couple more minutes before we get started. Getting a few more. All right. So, um, welcome everybody. My name is Jesus Torres. I will be your moderator, facilitator today between with the panelists. Uh, we have Maria, Oscar, and Carlo Chunga with us today. Um, I'm gonna start with myself. My name is Jesus Torres again. Um, I'm currently a senior at UTA and I'm an avid volunteer with Joel. I've been volunteering with them since April. My pronouns are he, him, and I was born in Monterrey, Mexico. Um, but myself, I'm not a DACA recipient. I'm undocumented. Um, one of the policies from DACA is you had to be here continuously since June 2007. And from that role, is I don't qualify. But we have our DACA recipients here, and they're helping. Uh, DACA is helping a lot of people. Um, Joel is uh, an organization. We're harnessing the power of the Latinx culture. We're empowering youth Latinos, transforming them to be civically engaged, transforming Texas. So we're a nonpartisan grassroots organization. Um, and let's um, move on. If we can start with Lily Carrasco, if you want to introduce yourself first. Okay, hi, my name is uh, Lily Carrasco. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I was born in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, and I moved to San Antonio, Texas when I was eight years old. I actually made the DACA cutoff by four days. I got here on June 11, 2007, and the deadline was um, June 15, 2007. Um, so that just tells you about how restrictive DACA is in general. Um, I recently graduated from Texas A&M University this past May. I didn't get a graduation, but it's okay. Um, and I'm currently working for the Wendy Davis for Congress campaign as a field organizer. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Oscar Hernandez, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Oscar Hernandez. Um, I'm a DACA recipient. Um, I am currently an organizer with Houston Action, organization that uh, we help to focus and support communities uh, of color to um, participate um, in a good civic life. By that we mean being able to vote, being able to fight the systemic uh, barriers that we face and um, the racism that happens to attack us every day in this country. Um, uh, I am a DACA recipient, like I mentioned, um, uh, through my work in the uh, past like 10, over 10 years, I've done a lot of work with the immigrant community and I'm happy to say that I was one of the few lucky undocumented people that was able to get a VA accreditation to support and help other people uh, legally fill out for DACA. So here in Houston, we helped hundreds not thousands of people get informed and apply for DACA for completely free of service, thanks to all the efforts and work from United We Dream and all the other organizations from Hillsk and uh, University of Houston Legal Clinic and a lot of other uh, amazing groups. So I'm very excited to be here. That's amazing. We love to hear it, all of y'all volunteering. And Carlo Chunga Pizarro, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlo Chunga Pizarro. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, él. I uh, was born in Pura, Peru. 
um, and I moved over to the U.S. in 2002. Um, I think it's, imp uh, I'll never forget, you know, watching the news and seeing uh, the attacks on 9-11 and just being traumatized. So asking my parents, why are we going over there? And them telling me it's for a better life. I know you're scared. I know, you know, you're feeling like this, but, you know, we have to do this for the sake of our family. And that memory is always embedded into, into uh, every, and to me, I always think about uh, why we moved here. Um, we moved to LA uh, for, and we lived there for a year and then we moved over to Texas where I've been residing for over 16 years now. Um, I'm currently a graduate student at Texas A&M University uh, where me and Lily attended actually, uh, both colleagues. So we did a lot of activism work there in our undergrad years. Um, but now I'm a current, uh, graduate assistant for the Department of Urban Planning and I work for also work for a, a program which helps unincorporated small towns create their comprehensive plan through community engagement and other methods of, of land use planning. Awesome. Thank you so much. Carlos Chunga Pizarro, um, he's joining us today. Um, he cleared his schedule for us. <laughs> Um, but let's get down to business. Um, so again, share it if you haven't yet, share it with your family, share this Facebook Live, but let's get started. Um, we're gonna talk about DACA, where it came from and where it might be headed. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a history of immigration. Uh, so the first uh, citizenship rule that the United States made was that any white person of good character could apply for citizenship. Um, and then after the War of 1812, Irish Catholics, German Catholics started to immigrate. Uh, this is when the United States started to require ships to report um, passenger ethnicities. And then the rise of the first anti-immigrant political party in the 1850s, the Know Nothing Party. They were using um, their beliefs of white Christian supremacy um, against Catholics. They were trying to seize political power over the minority groups, if that sounds familiar. <laughs> um, so in 1882, we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so even though Chinese people only made two two thousandths of a percent of the population, they wanted to restrict them. And this was the first legislation that um, started to restrict a certain group from certain immigrant group from a certain country. Um, so then in 1992, we had Ellis Island, you know, over 12 million immigrants entered through Ellis Island. Um, and then also in California, this is when Japanese segregation started, xenophobia pre-World War I. Um, so post-World War I, we had the Immigration Act of 1924. This is when the Border Patrol was established, uh, Customs Border Patrol. And it also granted visas to 2% of immigrants, but if they were only white immigrants, no Asian immigrants were included. Um, and then we moved down to World War II. You know, we had the Bracero program, who my grandpa was actually a part of. Uh, they came from Mexico. Um, they were laboring, they were laborers in agriculture mostly along the border. They were holding up the economy when uh, during total war. Uh, you know, and recently, um, not recently, but uh, in the late 1900s, we had amnesty. Our current system was an American, according to President uh, LBJ. So it was focusing on family re reunification and uh, um, 3 million Americans were able, 3 million people were able to become Americans through this um, amnesty. Uh, and in 2000, we had uh, the development, relief, education, and chip, um, sorry, feel free to chip in um, panelists if you have something to add. <laughs> uh, the Development Relief Education for Alien Minors or the DREAM Act, um, it failed multiple times in Congress, but it was offering conditional residence or a pathway to citizenship for um, uh, students and minors, again, under the age of um, a certain, I think it was 31 or 18 that wanted to be, um, American citizens or find a pathway to citizenship. Uh, so this brings us to DACA, um, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, it, like one of the policies that we had stated was 
that you had to be here before June of 2007, that you also had to be um, prior to the age of 31, and you had to be here before you were 16. Um, you had to be here also when the legislation was passed. Uh, so a lot of restrictions, again, that came with DACA. And something that's also being talked about right now is uh, HR6. Uh, if you want to support, let's talk about what HR6 is. So HR6 would also grant a pathway to citizenship with DACA, which DACA does not. Um, and it would uh, grant recipients of DACA, people born in another country um, who came to the United States, um, conditional permanent residence for 10 years and then remove proceedings if they meet that residence. So currently we have a president attempting to terminate DACA and slow down it's like the amount of people accepting applications. But recently we had the court uh, rule that DACA is constitutional, it is here to stay. And they continue to make changes to it, allowing less and less people to apply. So um, this brings us to the first question for um, if Lily wants to start this off. Uh, what is your opinion on this uh, court decision? Um, I think that whenever the court decision first came out, we were hesitant to be excited, but we still felt like it was something to um, celebrate because it did mean like at least like a little bit more protection for us. But now that we've seen that um, the the new the newest decision said that DACA recipients can only have to apply for DACA every single year. I don't think it's a good thing. That is honestly ridiculous that we have to pay a five hundred dollars subscription to this country every single year to stay here and have like mild protection. I think that's ridiculous. I think it's very restrictive and it's very classist, and it's just wrong. And so I feel like at this point, we should move past. DACA and this decision and into something that is more permanent and that includes all 11 million documented immigrants. Because I think what a lot of people forget is that we also left people behind. Like right now, like I'm 21 years old and I'm one of the youngest like DACA recipients just because you had to have been 16 years old by, um, I think it was March, March 15, 2018. That was three years, two years ago. I'm like less on the years, but that was two years ago. So there's, um, there's seniors in high school that are currently like just not protected under DACA. There's people that got here after 2007 that are not protected under DACA. So like, um, like people's perception of a dreamer just isn't real. Like dreamers are older now. Like there's younger people that are getting left behind. So we should absolutely move past DACA and pass the DACA decision. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, me too. I missed the, that cutoff from 2007 by six months even though I had been here since I was two years old, but because it was not continuous, um, you know, they, they stopped us. Does anybody else have anything to add to this decision? Um, yeah, I, I, I mentored a few high school kids throughout my years. And, you know, when this decision came out, it's, I want to tell them like, this is hope that this is a hope that we've been, we've been aching for for a very long time, but with, the current attacks that uh, Trump is posting on DACA and posting on the current DACA recipients, it just it removes away that hope that we've been we've been aching for. And you know, at a time where our community celebrated a lot, uh, when the decision came out, it felt like that was just taken away from us, just like everything has, you know, in most of our lives. You know, we can't even celebrate, you know, victories that we won. Uh, and, it's, and it continues to this heart, not only me, but you know all of the people who who should who should be who should have papers in this country, who should have DACA, who should have some sort of protection from deportation. And it continues to you know makes it just makes you feel like our community is continually um, just super sad, and we are always having to overcome a period of, of sadness after we even celebrated some wins. And, you know, it is very disheartening and hopefully that changes soon with the same rhetoric that Lily said that we have to move past DACA and come for a permanent solution for everybody. Facts. <laughs> All right, um, we'll move on to our next question. Um, 
if Oscar wants to start us off with this one, what do you think immigration, why do you think immigration is really hotly debated, especially here in the United States? Yeah, thank you. This is, um, uh, well, I think immigration is debated around the world because um, I think a lot of the, uh, every issue that is, I would talk about immigrants, it has to do with for, foreign uh, policy from the countries that have the most dominant power. So I, I know that in this side of the world, um, every decision that's made in the U.S. has a direct impact to every other country that's surrounding it. Um, even if you see when Trump was elected um, uh, president in 2016, uh, the price of the peso dropped significantly. So uh, like the U.S. is sometimes misunder, or at least guided through this idea that it's like it's its own planet, like it's detached from everything else. But everything that happens in this country has a, a direct effect to neighboring countries. And um, another reason why immigration is always debated is um, it, it doesn't take a lot, I think, in my mind to see that it's always a, a narrative in the U.S. to pin poor people against poor people. So whenever the, um, they they make it seem like immigrants are coming here to steal a job or I mean, that's that's always been one of the most ridiculous things I've heard. I'm, I've, I've never seen like um, like I, I was a landscaper for most of my um, my teenage years. My father mowed lawns, my, my mother cleaned houses. I mean, they didn't run up to somebody and be like, give me your lawnmower or something, you know, like it's such a ridiculous thing to say. It's actually very, very insulting. Um, and at the same time, when people say things like um, that immigrants do the jobs Americans don't want to do, uh, that's also not true. Um, because if, if the paying jobs in fields would pay people a livable wage, would pay people uh, overtime, would give people medical benefits, like everything that Americans want, Americans will work those jobs. Really, when people say things that immigrants would do jobs that Americans won't do, what they're really trying to say is that we can exploit immigrants and pay them less than livable wages so they can work very, very difficult jobs. And I mean, the, the core of everything is even as you went through some of the history of uh, immigration in the US, um, in, uh, the US is not a country of immigrants. Uh, the US has a lot of indigenous people, a lot of my ancestors and a lot of ancestors of a lot of people across this entire co continent are still living and have a deep rooted an ancestry. So the debate actually really comes into this idea of, of, of racism that hasn't been embedded through um, Catholicism, through political power, through the tyranny of a lot of these different groups who want to be, remain dominant. So the only reason, uh, uh, not the only reason, but I would say that the, the reason, or better yet, to keep in mind that this is a debate that is never going to end for as long as I'm going to be alive and as long as our descend descendants are going to be alive, um, this will continue because people want to pin um, issues uh, on uh, on people who are different than them. And because um, in this country, uh, the idea of white supremacy is not only embedded in the culture, but it's embedded in policy, it's embedded in foreign uh, policy, um, it will continue to happen. So. Um, uh, the cycle that happened in our, my community in Mexico, where um, the price of corn dropped and a lot of immigrants had to leave their homeland to come to the U.S. without realizing or knowing that the, uh, the, that the reason the price of corn dropped was because of how the U.S. interfered in, the, in their uh, countries and then coming here to get exploited and then to get blamed on for, um, as if we were doing as if we were to blame for the world's issues when it, it's actually tied into so much more. I agree. And I like that you brought up the concept of power because that's how you would pin the poor against the poor and that's how they stay where they stay. And by they, I mean like the country, the United States, not uh, the poor people because we are, you know, immigrants are put in that situation. Um, and we'll move on to our, to our next question. Um, how has DACA, in your opinion, uh, helped shape the immigration debate here in the United States? Um, and anybody can chime in if anybody has something to say. Carlo, if you want to start this one, or Oscar. Oh, go right ahead, Oscar. <laughs> well, um, I would say that uh, uh, first off, uh, DACA only happened because of the fight of uh, immigrant youth, especially young immigrant youth who participated in this, who were able to organize and push to make it happen. Like it wasn't something that was given. It wasn't something that uh, Obama decided to do either. It really took a lot of effort and strength to push it forward. So um, I think in that uh, in that aspect, that huge change happened because um, uh, 
people got organized. And I hope that uh, people who are viewing this or who are thinking about an impact of community is really that, like organize, uh, um, educate yourself and your community, and then come to decisions together, and then work with other collective groups who are trying to fight for the same cause you're doing. And that in itself, I think it wasn't just the fact that we have DACA, it was the fact that we were able to show that undocumented people in the US have a voice, we have people that care and love us enough to express their opinion with us in mind. And they took that to the ballots and they selected people who they felt would represent and keep us in mind. And then they pushed the people who, uh, who they elected to make sure that something happened. And then the fact that we still have it right now, um, it also goes to show how complicated a lot of the decisions in the US are and, uh, um, by switching policy or even when it comes to executive orders. I mean, the, the Supreme Court actually decided that the Trump can actually get rid of DACA but that the way Trump decided to do it was incorrect. So that means that where DACA is right now, it's still on like, it's hanging by a string. Um, but at the same time, a lot of this will have to do on how uh, y'all and uh, me and, and people who are viewing uh, want to participate and move forward. Yeah, what, what Oscar said is, is very important to recognize the hard work of all the people who you know got us to where we are now and that was undocumented youth who went to obama's offices and demanded change uh, during his re-election campaign and i i really um i think daca has as you know it was the first really big win for the undocumented youth today we see people marching all over the place and you know right-wing conservatives tell us that's not going to do anything but that's not true it, DACA has shown that the more pressure that you put on people, the more pressure that you put on our politicians, um, you know, we can make change. We can have legislation passed to get us towards one more step towards complete equity and inequality in our in the immigration uh, uh, debate. And so, you know, this this DACA has really pushed immigrant youth to come out there and you know continue to fight. But it's also it also shows that you know a lot of people it, it helps it helped me personally like have more faith and have more strength to tell other people about my experience because I know I don't think I will be as loud as I am today about telling my story without DACA and that's really I, I give props to anybody without DACA who tells their story because you know that protection is really what what helps me and, and gives me that the force that I need to tell my story um, and go out to these debates and talk about it. Um, but, you know, DACA is just, just another strength, another force that, you know, we as immigrants have to, to continue to talk the debate and continue to fight for our, for our rights. I love that. Yeah, the power of the youth, community and then the power of the youth Latinx community and the power of all youth that are benefiting from DACA. Um, that brings us to the uh, intersectionality of DACA and like how it, uh, it, it affects Afro-Latinos and uh, people from African descent that are also coming here for asylum from the Middle East. Um, does anybody have something to share on that? On the intersectionality of DACA? and why this matters. Yeah, um, so I think uh, when it comes to speaking about, um, so I think we're talking about DACA is talking about immigrant rights and then recognition that immigrants are, are not just um, a Mexican or Latino. And I know that in Texas, that's um, anybody's, well, most people see brown people and they assume that they're Mexican, even though we have folks from Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador, like there's enormous populations outside of the Mexican community. And even within that uh, Latinx community, there are a variety of different um, nationalities. Um, US, uh, especially uh, here in Houston, I would say has one of the largest Vietnamese population, one of the largest Indian population, and I mean like South Asia. Um, it's, 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 it's huge. Um, um, different uh, communities are represented in Houston. And that's one of the, the big misconceptions that it only affects um, Latinos. And then another thing is that um, people often confuse DACA with the DREAM Act. And uh, these are not the same thing. 
uh, the DREAM Act didn't pass because the uh, Senate failed us and didn't pass the DREAM Act. Um, and uh, the DACA was like one of the things that was able to get through, but there is no pathway to citizenship, which is another misconception to what uh, DACA is. Uh, because, because you have this work permit, permit, which essentially is what it is, um, it allows you to work here, but you don't have any legal status. In other words, um, uh, you pay taxes, um, you have a social security, but you cannot benefit from that social security. So when the Tea Party goes out there screaming about taxation without representation, that's essentially every single DACA recipient. So when y'all mentioned about 800,000 people who have DACA, and those are only the people who got accepted, never mind the people who actually applied for DACA, who got denied DACA. We're talking billions of dollars that went into the country just from the application alone. And this doesn't include the, the billions of dollars that are coming in thanks to taxes or property taxes or work taxes, everything that's coming into the social security. Yet we have um, a lot of people who, who still technically don't have status. I mean, technically we have a work permit, but that's not a legal status to be in the US. So, um, and, and another huge thing that, that I, we're not really safe you know, that's like one of the things that gets to me. Um, like I, I used to protest a lot of people even before DACA and we would say undocumented and unafraid. Not like the biggest irony is that I have DACA, but I'm afraid, you know, like this is like a serious uh, situation in which we find ourselves because this administration now has the information and I mean fingerprints and photos and addresses over 800,000 people. Um, and they're attempting every which way they can to get rid of it. And that's that's alarming. It's 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 a big deal. I I'm learning so much. The things that I did not even know. Go ahead, Lily. Um, as far as the intersectionality with DACA, I would like to bring up like the intersectionality as far as like with immigration, like what we just saw yesterday about how um, migrant women in detention centers are being like they're getting their uteruses taken out of them without their consent. That's just, that shows like a lot of intersectionality between like women's rights and, um, and immigration. And it's crazy because like, like once again, like it is under the radar, like people, people who call themselves pro-life, people who call themselves pro-choice have not said a single thing about like migrant women literally just having their uteruses ripped out of them. They're not getting the choice to have children or to not have children. And, um, you know, that just shows you like, you can't call yourself a feminist if you're not for like the abolishing of ICE and the abolishing of detention centers and prisons. It's um, like, it's all the same thing. And that just shows you how like there's intersectionality within like identities and also with like struggles, like they're women, they're undocumented, they're um, like brown and black, like people of color. And yeah, and, like no one's talking about it. So yeah. We, like Oscar said, we can put pressure on the courts. The courts will listen to the people most of the time, some of the time, but we have that power, public, the public, the, what we say has that power. We need to go harder for these people with this public that are powerless and they can't fight for themselves. Um, but yeah, um, so uh, our, uh, another question. Um, what is a challenge you face as a DACA recipient that may surprise others that are not familiar with your situation personally? And if anybody has something that they thought, think of. Yeah, th this kind of intersects back to the previous question when talking about intersectionality, um, especially in the times we're living in right now in the pandemic. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a hazards analysis uh, a researcher and one thing that we looked a lot about is social vulnerability, how things like low income um, and other aspects of uh, social characteristics, you know, can hurt families and individuals during times of crisis, during disaster and events. And now with the pandemic, like, um, you know, I have, I see the care side getting, you know, getting passed in Congress and people applauding that, but it leaves out undocumented youth, undocumented people in college, undocumented, families and you know applause for the California legislation for you know having get, getting some of that funding to uh, using funding from their legislation to give it to uh, NGOs in California and passing that on to uh, undocumented undocumented families but you know that's that's one of the, the biggest struggles uh, for me right now is I'm having to 
have to uh, work, um, be a full-time student, and then help my family. And luckily, I got some of the care side, but my family didn't. And so I have to use that money to you know, help out in some sort of way um, because you know we weren't thought about when that legislation was passed. And, and we, and you know, we're going on the six month now of, of the pandemic, uh, who knows how long more even more and, you know, people are getting evicted and a lot of people that are getting taken advantage of during, uh, during that is undocumented families who, who are struggling to find work because of the pandemic. And we must do whatever it takes to make sure no one is left behind and make sure people are housed get resources and that's all through you know local organizing because people in the federal level and even state level can get done, can get stuff done fast enough and it's up to us organizers to do something about this and help our community out yeah does anybody else have something that would surprise other people to learn about your situation with daca yeah if i could add um so um one, I, I think it's sometimes surprising how surprised people get. You know, um, people who uh, have DACA in many cases have no other way of getting any kind of uh, um, status. So that means no residency, no citizenship. And there's like um, uh, these like right wing talking points that we're always talking about getting in line when these are people who never studied immigration law, people who really don't understand the complexity, um, who usually share that, but they were developed by people who do study immigration law, who actually know that none of this is real and are only using this as a political ploy to move people. Um, and, and because of this, um, uh, there, there is this uh, um, other excuses to have anger towards uh, um, undocumented people in the US. Um, the, I mean, we can also see not only how the US treats its citizens, we have um, uh, one of the largest populations that are in prison are, bl are black folks. And there are a lot of black folks who are in prison for nonviolent crimes, especially people who have either bought or sold or even used marijuana. Well, at the same time, it's not only being decriminalized in many states, um, white people are selling it like crazy. And there are people who are making millions and millions of dollars of selling this while there are young black kids in prison right now. And at the same time, if you're an immigrant, uh, certain misdemeanor issues that, that would have affect citizens become felonies when you do it. So if you're a citizen and you wanna smoke a joint and there's an undocumented person with you, know that you might get slapped in the, in the hand, but that person might either end up in jail and deported. So like, these are like bigger consequences that, that affect people who are, who are undocumented, especially immig immigrants who in the US because of the way these laws are designed. You know, uh, these are um, also not just misconceptions, I would say, or things that are surprising to people. Like things are developed this way in this country to criminalize people. And they have that intention. And it doesn't take a lot to view um, uh, like how a lot of this started and, and why is it that we end up in a place where if um, uh, where undocumented people are treated the way that they're doing. Um, another thing, the uh, last thing I'll say, so I want to pass that to Lily. Um, would be that uh, there are like a lot of people who um, who are in the U.S. who have DACA and who unfortunately, um, and I know because I've met them, are very right wing, actually very anti-immigrant. And that's also a big misconception that because people have DACA that we feel the same way about each other when it is not true. And a lot of the times this happens because there is, uh, again, and I, this is more to do with um, a, a miseducation because of the way the system is developed to educate young people in this country, where people have no idea that these issues are affecting them. And they end up feeling uh, th that uh, they need to prove themselves by being even rougher towards the community that looks just like them. And that's a common thing that happens a lot. So you will have a lot. Of, I mean, I learned this a lot of this doing the DREAM Act. There's a lot of people who went to college, who studied and who didn't know they were undocumented until they had to get that license. And that was a huge shock to their systems. That wasn't a shock to me because when I was a kid, like we had to hide from, uh, from uh, well, it wasn't ICE back then, it was the INS and immigration officers who came knocking on the doors many times. Like these are shocks and traumas that we've had. And I would, I would just add the very, very last thing to this because I, I know I'm probably talking way too much. And that is that no matter what happens with DACA, like best case scenario, they were able to gain citizenship that is not going to take away the years of trauma 
and an oppressive government that goes after our people. So the citizenship is not a solution to the things that we're going through. It's one of the things that we will greatly benefit from, but being an American does not solve our problems. Like we still have to face racism. We still have to face the oppressive, the, the oppression that goes through people and the exploitation of, of our people that happen in this country and in the foreign policy that this country forces on our countries that force this migration to happen. I agree. I agree. Like I learned so much in that statement that I'm surprised with that, like you said, like no matter no matter where it goes, no matter where that goes, we'll always have to fight. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, questions from uh, the people that are sending us through Facebook Live. Um, and if you have questions, send them in. But um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and read the first one. Um, what can we do to raise awareness of this issue and as a still pressing issue among a lot of current events that um, that we've seen. How do we raise awareness on this issue among the, the events that we've seen currently? Um, like everyone says, like always contact your representative, like find out who, like who represents you. If you're a citizen, you have the privilege to vote, so vote. But also um, me and Carla always talk about this. We always mention it, like listen to undocumented people. Like like if there's like a panel like this, um, do not like if you're a citizen and you think you should be the one to talk about being undocumented or struggles as an undocumented person or a DACA recipient, do not take that because you're a citizen. Like you do not, you do not face that kind of oppression. That's not that's not for you to talk about. So like as always, like listen to DACA recipients, listen to undocumented people, like listen to people who are actually like here, you know. So I feel like that's like the main thing to do as a citizen, but always like, as always like vote, there's 48 days until election day. Early voting starts in 26 days. Yeah, so like that. there's obviously more. All right, uh, we'll move on to our next one. Um, I heard HR6 does allow a path to citizenship. Do y'all know who wrote it and if it has any chance of passing? It sounds too good to be true. Um, maybe so. Uh, yes. Uh, Lucille Royal Allard wrote it. She's a representative from California and it passed out of the House of Representatives last summer. I think it was like June 4, 2019. Um, no chance of passing the Senate. Like I don't, unless like something like completely drastic changes after election day. Um, and we like, and Democrats like take over the Senate. But other than that, um, I doubt it. I feel like at this point, a lot of us unfortunately. Yeah, I, I don't trust either party too. And when it comes to terms of passing any of this, um, uh, it also has to be signed, which means that um, uh, if, if the if we head in direction we, we've been, um, that's not likely to happen. Um, but all that being said, you know, it, it's, it's, um, I've, I've had a lot of people go through so much trauma and so much pain by um, trying to figure out how to pass the Dream Act. And then getting into these high moments of whether the Dream Act was going to pass and then crushing them when it didn't. And so uh, when it comes to being an organizer, you know, you have to get used to getting your heart broken because uh, that's what happens a lot of the time. But through that heartache, I would say what you end up develop developing is uh, you know, friendships and people. There are people that I know. I've met some of the most amazing people in my life um, through struggling with them. And, and I think that's the same key when we talking to everybody, you know, I, I I'm not beholden to a political party. I'm not beholden to, a, to even a, a, an ideology. You know, it, it really matters that, you know, talk to somebody, crack a joke, you know, share your struggle or share what you're going through. And it'll be really hard for somebody um, unless they don't care about you, but it'd be really hard for somebody to actually uh, um, not think about you, to, about you, what you're struggling when, when they're going out there and, and participating, whether it be in the elections or in their everyday lives. I don't know that um, I have a lot of hope with uh, with the Dream Act passing, but at the same time, I didn't think DACA was going to pass. You know, I know that DAPA was stalled for you know the, the what was supposed to be for parents. I know that that was stalled and halted and is still lost in the courts, but that did pass. And again, like those are things that happened because people got involved, and and uh, specifically in uh, um, immigrant youth. Um, I would say though that you know um, 
do what you can, do what your heart allows you to do, push as much as you can. But if you have to step back for your own mental health and work, just know that there's hundreds and thousands of other youth out there who are also willing to push and who might even encourage you to do it when you're ready. So participate. Um, uh, if you cannot vote, push someone else to vote, like really ask them to. Uh, if you can't do that, at the very least, just continue talking to your people, talk to your neighbors, you know, and, and when you feel comfortable and you think it's ready, talk about why this matters to you. Talk about why it's, you're undocumented, you know, express your concerns. And then um, um, trust that your neighbors or the people you care about um, will think about you when this is happening. Whether that whether that sways their vote, it's, it's it's challenging. But I just I just hate the idea that that there's so many there of us, and um, I probably shouldn't say us because we talk about a lot of youth right now. You know, young young folks who um, who have so much anxiety, who have um, who are struggling through mental health, who are going through all this pain, and who feel like. Um, I know because I've gone through it, like, um, like if this doesn't pass, that's it for me. But in many cases, you just have to look up at your elders, you know, look at your mother, your father, your uncles, look at people in your neighborhood. And realize how many undocumented people have actually thrived and make things happen through some of the worst conditions. And try to figure out what is it that they use to push themselves? What is it that, they, that helped them? And then what practices you can gain from that to help you um, and your community? I agree. Um, and that, I think that touches also on the next question a little bit on, on uh, the people without DACA and how this affects their experience. And I'll touch on that a little bit because like I mentioned, I'm not a DACA recipient, but um, I do have friends that are DACA recipients and they benefit from DACA. Um, a lot of the times, you know, I'm also fighting for them because in like, this is on me, like my opinion, uh, if, if I see them, um, if I know that they're gonna go somewhere, they're gonna uh, they're gonna be able to like at least have um, be able to get a job. Then maybe later, at least maybe I can fight for something for myself. But if we don't push something, like we have to start somewhere. Uh, but I also like I face a lot of like not privilege because DACA people are also still being suppressed, but. Um, you know, just the, that slight uh, opportunity that they have over us, over people that don't have DACA. But we, I mean, we have to work harder. And we're talking about HR6. We just have to um, continue pushing forward. And if anybody else wants to touch on how that affects anybody that ha maybe has an experience on people without DACA. Okay, we'll move on because I, I'm the only non-DACA recipient here <laughs> yeah it, yeah no this is not we all have DACA we all have the privilege of having DACA so this is not for us to talk about I think if you feel comfortable you can go off for as long as you want <laughs> well, I don't know I don't fully agree with that because like uh, I have family members who don't have DACA like just because I have it or and, and does not mean that um, people who don't like I have friends who have TPS and if you know what happened this last week with TPS we're revoking it from for a lot of people, specifically in Latin American communities. I mean, that's heartbreaking. I have friends who are gonna lose their TPS, which is a temporary protect, you know, temporary protection that they have, you know, it, it, which is similar to DACA, it's essentially a work permit. And I think it's, um, honestly, I think it's, 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 it's infuriating to see so many things and how many, how many times our communities get attacked for every single thing that, that we're trying to do. And there are people who have DACA who might potentially benefit from, oh. from a lot of other uh, um, uh, immigration uh, benefits, but they won't be able to because the laws are shifting. You know, like this thing is really, really complicated. Um, there are a lot of people right now who, um, who just like you, Jesus, like um, didn't qualify for DACA. I mean, I had, I had literal 16 year old babies uh, uh, when we were trying to help them out with a DACA application. And some of them were off by a week and they couldn't apply. And they literally felt like that, like that was it for them. You know, um, it's not, uh, um, I, I think I often struggle with the idea of whatever privilege means because like we're all struggling in this thing. Having one, advantage to what you're to what other people are going to does not necessarily put me in a privileged position I think yes yeah. I have DACA but at the same time like that doesn't really matter to a lot of the people who are attacking us 
And even though I have this like temporary protection, we can see how easily that can be taken away. So I still like, even though I have DACA, I guarantee you Jesus, I'm just as frightened, I'm just as worried, and I have the exact same concerns that you have. And I think all of the other speakers uh, might feel the same way. Like it's, it, it hasn't changed much for me. I mean, uh, um, I'm not gonna lie that being able to work, being able to do the stuff that I do has changed my life. But at the same time, it, it, it's, I'm still in the same position I was before. Yeah, I mean, as we're, we don't want to pit, like you said earlier, poor against the poor. We are all here to uh, push immigrant rights, to um, make sure that we all have a seat at the table in Congress and pass that. Uh, I'm going to move on to the last question. Uh, in your opinion, and anybody can chime in again, uh, would it be safe for DACA recipients to apply for advanced parole? Sorry, I know I keep, keep jumping in. I don't think this is a matter of opinion. This is a, a, like a legal question. So I, I would like advise people if they want to apply to advanced parole to talk to an attorney. Currently, I don't think this administration has given anything around advanced parole. And most people are suggesting not to apply for advanced parole. The closest I've gotten, people should check out ILRC, MALDEF, United We Dream. And right now, no one should be applying for advanced parole because, uh, um, and this is like, this is, this to me really strikes a nerve because like, Houston is one of the leading places for fraud when it comes to immigration. Um, uh, and when people are applying for things, you will get like these notarios who pretend to be attorneys who steal from our community. And uh, I've had actually people who had advanced parole left the country, but they didn't get uh, vetted by an attorney. And then when they try to come back, they found out that they had some prior issues that didn't allow them to come to event, come back into the country because they applied for advanced parole via per false premises. Now, that is a huge issue that happened uh, on the previous administration when advanced parole was available. Currently, there isn't advanced parole, at least to my knowledge, that people can apply for. Uh, the DACA application is only for one year um, and the advanced parole to leave the country might be for like, like this really, really extreme circumstances, but I haven't heard a, a, a reliable attorney say that it's safe to apply for it because you don't know what's gonna happen when you leave the country. Right. Um, okay, well, we are running out of time. We don't want to keep uh, dinner waiting porque se enfría. <laughs> it gets cold. Um, so here's things that you could do uh, to help us uh, with the future of DACA and just the future of immigrant rights. Um, you can, like we were talking about registered to vote. Um, they're putting, um, my uh, an organizer is putting uh, the yeah register to vote register register to vote uh, Joel uh, link. Uh, the census is also ending. They're counting the count this September thirtieth. That's like next week. And Texas has like uh, sixty something percent self response rate. So we need to get on that. We need to get on the twenty twenty census.gov. Uh, and tell that to your friends, through your networks, everybody you know. Uh, again, HR6, if you want to support that, uh, you might like call your senators, Ted Cruz, John Cornyn, uh, Texans need to be heard. And uh, that's, that's one way that we can do, help. Um, also, you can get involved with us. Like I, I was saying, I've been a volunteer since um, April and we have volunteer hours every Wednesday and Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook, Joel Texas. Uh, you can just find the links here. But if uh, the panelists want to do remarks or anything else that uh, y'all may want to say, uh, I, I say sign up. Just uh, told my undocumented and uh, youth all my undocumented families uh, listening to this. Please practice self care. Um, these are tough times that we're, that we're going to be going through, uh, like Oscar mentioned about generational trauma that, you know, our community will be experiencing. Um, you know, it's okay to have a picnic out. It's okay to step away from this for a while and just uh, self-care and, you know, you know, relax because it is a long fight and this fight is going to be continue on, I honestly believe. 
for decades um, and you know it's important for us to be healthy um, and it is, it's really important for us to be close to our families and our communities uh, who are there for us. Uh, I'm shame plug to the Council for Minority Student Affairs who helped me throughout my entire uh, college career just, just as a family uh, to practice self-care and to practice you know loving each other during these tough times. Yeah, loving it, uh, love to hear it. Um, so I think that's all the time that we have. Um, it was, I learned, yes. Make a small plug, just um, if you need any uh, help with legal services, please look up Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative for those of you who are in Houston and you can connect to a lot of different um, nonprofits to do legal services. Some of them are free and some of them are at very low cost. That's Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative. And then for those who want to participate, um, Houston in Action, we are hosting phone bankings for um, census and for voter engagement um, every day um, um, from now until the end of census, which is the end of September, um, and then from now to the end of uh, the elections, which is coming November 3rd. So uh, you can go to our website at houstonaction.org, click on census or elections, whatever you're interested in. Um, also follow us on the hashtag H-Town Counts or H-Town Votes, so you can see how you can connect it to our issues. But we do need more people supporting um, uh, making these phone calls to make sure our communities get counted and to make sure that people are out and, and voting and registering. Thank you so much to Jolt for opening up like the floor for these kinds of conversations and for especially like uplifting undocumented voices instead of having like you know citizens speak over for um, like issues that they're not necessarily experiencing. So that is really important and I'm really thankful. Yes, thank you. And uh, also uh, one more event, uh, the National Voter Registration Day is uh, September 22nd and uh, an organization, Move Texas is doing a phone banking all that day. They're having a multicast on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And they're also, um, they're gonna be calling up phone banking people who have not registered to vote yet, youth uh, under 30. Uh, we, uh, we plan on making up to maybe 100,000 to 300,000 phone calls. So if you have time on November 22nd, visit that website and sign up for a ship. But uh, that's all the time that we have. Uh, it, I've learned so much. Uh, like I said, like there's things that I did not know about DACA, about HB6, about everything and about the experiences um, that other people might be going through that I'm unaware to, or that other people might be unaware to. Um, but yeah, and yeah, have a great night, stay safe and <laughs> stay, in, stay inside. <laughs>